Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kentaro Toyama. I've had a long association with Kentaro, so I guess I know a few things about him. I'll try not to, uh, hell, I won't spare him embarrassment anyway. Why should I do that? So I know Kentaro came to Microsoft Research right after grad school, and I remember that he really didn't want to join MSR because he wanted to go and um, build a startup or something like that. He said, eh, I don't know. We convinced him that he had great research potential. Um, I think we turned out to be right because now he is a professor at University of Michigan pursuing academic career. Uh, my association with Kentaro was right from the beginning, but I came to know him really when he uh, went to India with me to co-found the Microsoft Research India Lab. And uh, one of the reasons I asked Kentaro, who's not Indian, although he can pass for somebody from Sikkim or something, but uh, you know, to go, go to India with me and not any of the other people who are from India, is because he was always an out-of-the-box thinker. And uh, so for Kentaro, every time he was uh, doing something, he, for some reason, became extremely critical of how it was being done, who was doing it, what was being done, and then went out and started challenging and questioning it. I said, OK, this is the kind of person I need to help me set up the lab. And I'm a very you know traditional person, I think, uh, linearly and things like that. So, of course, in India, he had a great time. I think, uh, I'm not sure he's going to tell you about it. In India experience here, some of it is uh, kind of comes through in the book. But one of the things, uh, you know, in working with Kentaro through the years, I realized is, you know, and I came to appreciate a lot is that he's tremendously articulate. His ability to speak about anything, analyze things, and deeply analytic Extremely argumentative. I'm not sure I want to go to that side too much. I've, I've had a lot of arguments with Kentaro. And uh, can stand on his ground, and an amazingly good writer. And most of you, you know, if you have already read the book, you already know that fact. I think he's one of the most uh, uh, entertaining and crisp writers of, on pretty much any subject. And, uh, you know, he did that. And then suddenly he had this uh, disillusionment about the work he was doing and the mission he was on, which again is reflected in the book and came back to the US, uh, I think with the mission, I don't know whether it was with the mission of writing a book right away, but that's what it led to. Uh, he also has a blog, I think it's called uh, something Jester, what is it? ICTD. ICTD Jester, you should read that. It's, it's a bit more, uh, you know, removes his gloves uh, quite a bit more on that forum and it's quite entertaining to read. Uh, if you're not sure, and if you don't watch out, it might cite you or quote you on that, so you don't know if you want to know that or something. But anyway, he's, I, I, I think you're in for a treat. If you have read the book, you already know that. But otherwise, uh, thank you again for me being here and Kentaro. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anandan. Um, yeah, with respect to writing, you know, the, one of the things that uh, I kind of did right before I left Microsoft was, you know, kind of go through a list of all the skills that I have. And I realized that if I, while I was at Microsoft, I probably spent more hours writing emails than anything else. And so it occurred to me that maybe I could do that part a little bit more professionally. Uh, and so that's kind of the lead up. Um, so Ananda mentioned that uh, he and I went to India to co-found Microsoft Research India. And um, you know, it, India is a very unique place. Uh, and so the lab itself was also very unique. This is a photograph of the first building that we were in. And, you know, we had regularly had uh, farm animals walk in front of the building, which is probably something that you could not say for any of the other Microsoft research labs. Um, and while I was there, uh, I started a research group that focused on how to use digital technologies for international development. So for projects in agriculture, education, healthcare, governance, microfinance, um, all in a bid to try to find ways to uh, help alleviate poverty. Uh, so just to give you a flavor for one of those projects, um, Indrani Mehdi, her face is kind of a little bit hidden over there, but she was a researcher in my group, and one of the things that she worked on was how to design user interfaces so they could be used by people who were not literate. Uh, we call this project text-free user interfaces, and the idea was to basically find ways to use interfaces that have practical value for, um, for different communities, in this case, women who lived in uh, slums in Bangalore, uh, and to see if we could do something to help them use the, te uh, use the, te use the technology. 
Um, I'm not going to get too far into the actual project itself, but one of the things that was interesting about this project was that uh, what we found was even among non-literate women, there was a range of kind of you know, preparation for, mental preparation for using a computer interface. And um, all the things that, you know, Indrani kept finding was that there were some women who, despite the fact that they couldn't read, could actually very quickly navigate the user interfaces that we designed. You know, these were interfaces with lots of graphics, video, audio cues. And then there were other women that seemed to have a lot of challenges. And she, you know, she hypothesized that it might have to do with their level of formal education, you know, maybe with their kind of cognitive skills overall. And we did a study in which we kind of looked for, um, you know, looked at how quickly uh, different people could navigate a particular text-free user interface um, based on different kinds of menu structures. So some with very deep kind of hierarchical menus, some with more shallow ones, and then one being a very flat list. And uh, basically what we found was exactly what she hypothesized, which was that if you had more, there was a tendency if you had more formal education to be able to navigate these interfaces uh, better than people with uh, much less education, even if None, none of these people could read, and the interfaces had no text in them whatsoever. Um, over the five plus years that I was in India, I, you know, I of course did uh, oversaw lots of different projects, uh, and also read about other people's projects in this field of ICT, uh, which stands for Information and Communication Technologies and Development. And in project after project, this kind of phenomenon was visible. So, for example. In another uh, study that we also did, this one with people who were semi-literate. So it turns out that you know, a lot of people have learned the alphabet, they can pronounce phonemes and so on, but they still struggle to, let's say, read a newspaper. Um, so people who were semi-literate, literate, and with them what we did was we would provide little text cues next to icons so that in the hopes that over time they would begin to recognize the text cues uh, and then be able to navigate the interface uh, more and more quickly. And we found exactly that phenomenon. But again, if you started off with more literacy, the text helped you much more, and you actually improved in your literacy more rapidly. If you started off with no literacy, um, of course, the text didn't help at all. And then if you had a little bit of literacy, then it helped you somewhere in the middle. Um, <clears throat> this is a, yet another study, not in our lab. Uh, they looked at the use of mobile phones by uh, small uh, entrepreneurs in, I think this was in Indonesia. And what they found was that the entrepreneurs who had the greater capacity as entrepreneurs would actually take advantage of their mobile phones more for business and basically expand their businesses, whereas those who didn't have a lot of you know, capacity as entrepreneurs didn't do so well. Um, and here's another study, this one in uh, Tanzania with healthcare uh, workers in the rural areas. And here the idea was to see how they could kind of monitor healthcare workers so that they were actually seeing the patients they were supposed to see, uh, do their rounds. And the interesting thing about this study was they started off with um, SMS text messages as a way to remind healthcare workers to see certain patients, as well as with human supervisors who kind of you know, basically meted out either some kind of scolding or encouragement as the uh, health workers did their jobs. And what you see in this first graph, first of all, is that the combined system with the supervisors and the text messages actually does much better than a control situation where there's no um, reminder whatsoever. But once you leave out the supervisors, once you leave out the human element, the text messages by themselves eventually converge to the control situation, which is just as good as not having the text messages. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this happens over and over and over again, where you see the impact of technology uh, having a gradient depending on uh, who is involved, who the users are, uh, who, what kind of organizations are using a technology. So, um, you know, I basically thought really hard about why this pattern repeated over and over, and, and I came to this very simple conclusion, which is not new in any sense, but it's basically that technology effectively amplifies underlying human forces. So to the extent that those human forces are capable uh, and directed in the right direction, you can expect technology to augment that and to cause uh, positive value. But where those uh, human forces might be corrupt or dysfunctional, the technology either does nothing or in some cases it makes things worse. And I believe this explains why so many of us probably in this room all have very positive experiences with technology, but that that same positive experience does not transfer with the transfer of technology to other contexts, necessarily. Um, incidentally, I'm going to ask this group uh, if anybody recognizes this quote. So the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. 
Anybody recognize who that's from? Who hasn't read the book? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, all right, so if you read the book, yeah, anybody remember who this quote was from? Bill Gates. Bill Gates, yes. So this is from Bill Gates, The Road Ahead. And I believe this is exactly the thesis that I am uh, going to try to argue. Now, this idea is quite straightforward, right? It basically just says that technology is a tool and that it amplifies the tool user uh, and whatever their intentions are. Um, but it also has lots and lots of counterintuitive ideas that I don't think we necessarily follow through. Uh, and these are, you know, these fall out like co corollaries. They're very a logical extension to the basic idea. Um, but before I go there, I'm going to suggest that, you know, we are really living in an age in which uh, technology is seen as the savior to all kinds of social problems. Uh, so uh, Arne Duncan is the tall gentleman on the right next to President Obama, and he says, technology is a game changer in the field of education, a game changer that we desperately need both to improve achievement for all and increase equity. Okay, and in this particular speech that he gave, uh, it was at the South by Southwest conference, he mentioned the word technology 46 times. Uh, in comparison, he mentioned the word teacher only about 25 times. Okay, so for him, the technology is far more important uh, than uh, teachers. Uh, Hil Hillary Clinton, so you know, this is an image from the um, Egyptian Revolution, and Hillary Clinton says, access to information helps citizens hold their governments accountable. And she, in 2011, she basically uh, uh, began a foreign policy doctrine called Internet Freedom, where the idea was that the United States would, in addition to all of the other things it does, you know, champion the idea that the Internet should be a, a site for free and open uh, expression. Um, next. Here's Mark Zuckerberg. So here's a quote that he, uh, here's something that he said when he rolled out uh, internet.org, which is a um, project to try to get the internet to more users. Uh, the richest 500 million people have way more money than the next six billion combined. You saw that by getting everyone online. Okay, so he's claiming that the way to solve social economic inequality in the world is by giving everybody the internet. Um, now, these you know, statements sound a little bit outlandish, but they come from very powerful people who hold key positions that have a lot of resources, right? So combined, Arne Duncan, Hillary Clinton, Mark Zuckerberg, and really this list goes on and on. Um, most of the CEOs in Silicon Valley have at some point made claims along these lines. Increasingly, um, people who have nothing to do with technology you know, will uh, make similar claims and so forth. And um, you know, the overall impression that you get is that if we simply invent more technologies and spread more of them throughout the world uh, that the world will naturally become a better place. And what I'm going to suggest is that that was not our experience in part because of this amplification phenomenon and also for um, other reasons that I'll get into. So at this point I'm going to uh, ask everybody a set of a few, a few questions. Okay so the first one uh, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand wh wherever you agree with the question. Okay so are you as rich as you like to be? Anybody? Okay, so this is a Microsoft crowd, quite a few satisfied people. <laughs> Very good. Um, are you as educated as you like to be? Okay, uh, probably about a third of the hands. Earlier there was about a third of the hands. Are you as compassionate as you like to be? Okay, a few people. Um, did anybody raise their hands all three times? Maybe? Okay, so um, uh, I actually get a lot fewer hands in the audience, especially for the first two questions in most audiences, but this is a very well-educated and uh, reasonably well-paid audience. But my claim is that anybody, everybody in this room should, in theory, if we believe in uh, you know, the internet as an incredible tool, be able to say yes to all these questions because in fact you have access to all of the information you need to be these things. Um, for example, if you search how to be rich, you get 41 million hits on how to answer that question. And some of that information, you know, a lot of it is um, a little bit, you know, it's a bit of quackery, but a lot of it is, uh, is reasonable. Um, are you as educated? Well, these days there are massive online, uh, massive open online courses, and you can really, you know, get an education in just about any topic. Uh, and here's the Dalai Lama, a guide to cultivating compassion in your life. Um, so one question for all of you, you know, who didn't raise your hands is why, what are you waiting for? Why isn't the information enough? Krista, okay, time, certainly one. Anybody else? I think I could always be better. You think you could always be better? Yeah. Right, so you might have a much higher ideal, ideal than what you happen to be currently. Right, and there will always be, that's, that's certainly true. Anybody else? Yes? 
takes time to process all the information. It takes time to process all the information. Uh, terrific. So all of that is true. Definitely time. Um, and you know, based on your answers to the first question, you know, this is not necessarily a group that believes that resources are a limitation. But of course, for many people in the world, it's you know, the time, the resources, uh, just the sheer amount of mental energy you have left at the end of a hard work day. Um, all of these things are constraints. Uh, so you know, the idea that the information is the bottleneck to causing certain kinds of social change is um, is flawed at least because it's not that you know it's not that information is not needed. It's just that it's not really the bottleneck to the things that unlock uh, you know individual change in people. And for this reason, um, information isn't education. Uh, communication doesn't in and of itself lead to peace. Uh, technology doesn't actually lead to economic growth. And I can go into each of those questions at a different stage. Okay, next question. In which of the following countries is democratic free speech uh, most available online? Okay, what do you think? Okay, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily know a lot about these countries, but based on the question, over these four countries, which do you think has the most democratic free speech online? Okay, who thinks A, North Korea? Okay, nobody. B, China. Anybody? Maybe. Okay, one hand. C, Russia. A couple of hands. D, the United States. Okay, so the vast majority of you. Uh, and why do you think that? I mean, we I've obviously hear, read a lot of stories about censorship in these other countries. So Terrific. if I believe the news reporting, that's what it tends to suggest. Okay, so in many of these other countries, there's censorship. Good. What else? I think it has partly to do just with my education in grade school, where the democratic country, there was a freedom country, everything freedom. It, it's, it, I think it's a part of my ingrained. Okay, so social. because of your education, so in fact, there's a culture of kind of free speech in the United States. That's good. So all of these things are true. Um, you know, I put these three countries here because they actually are very different with respect to the internet. In North Korea, it turns out they have their own internet. It uses the same IP protocols as the internet in the United States, but it is completely closed off. And you know, certain IP addresses are basically mapped to different machines in, uh, in North Korea. And a few you know, high-level officials have access to the larger internet outside of that. But otherwise, North Koreans, even if they have access to quote unquote the internet, um, are only speaking to each other. And I'm pretty darn sure that nobody there is criticizing the supreme leader on social media. Uh, China, interestingly, has an amazing um, censorship force, as Rick mentioned. Uh, it is something like 300 to 400,000 person strong, right? So that's both private and public sector. And uh, it turns out that some ridiculous percentage of social media posts actually get centered. It's in the order of you know, 10%. Um, and, uh, you know, and one of the things that they found was that it wasn't that uh, the government was censoring criticism of the government. It was censoring anything that could provoke mass action, physical mass action. So whether it was protests in the street or even a lot of people getting together for you know, what we, we would call a flash mob. Um, all of that is what the government most fears. Uh, in Russia, interestingly, there is actually quite a bit of quote unquote free speech, but there's also an incredible campaign to spread misinformation. So uh, Putin's government, uh, just recently there, was, there were some articles um, in the New York Times Magazine and other places where you know, there's a vast campaign with spreading misinformation so that pe average people can't trust the things that uh, everybody is reading. And so you can't tell you know, what's real information, what's really uh, um, citizen information, and what is uh, based on the government. And of course, in the United States, we generally have free speech online. Uh, and my contention here is that we have these things because we have free speech offline. It's not that the internet, the technology that runs the internet, somehow is more democratizing in and of itself, but that as it goes to different countries, the various uh, you know, centers of power mold it in a form that reflects uh, what they would like to see. Um, so here is uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, and I believe he is, I guess he's showing off the internet to a bunch of generals. All right, so uh, last question. Uh, imagine that you and a very poor, uh, I say rural farmer here, but just imagine the poorest person you can imagine who is involuntarily poor. Okay? The invo involuntary part is important. I'm not expecting you to uh, think of a you know, well-educated, contented monk. Um, and that you had uh, exactly one week of free, unlimited access to the internet to raise as much money for the charity of your choice. Okay? So the question is, who would be able to raise more money? You or this very poor person? Okay, who thinks you? Okay, most people, and who thinks the other person? Okay, good. Why and why you? Because uh, I know people have money. Connection. Good. So you have rich friends. Yes. What else? <laughs> you have the social capital. Yeah. Right. Social capital. Good. You have a lot of connections. Awareness of the resources. 
Kickstarter. Absolutely. So you are much more literate about the resources, uh, and you also have the kind of education that will allow you to write, you know, persuasive emails, all of these things. Um, you know, this thought experiment is meant to illustrate that you can hold the technology constant and the outcomes can be dramatically different. And, you know, you can also flip this. So imagine that you're running the same uh, experiment, but not with somebody who's very poor, but with either Bill Clinton or Bill Gates. Okay, who would be able to raise more money? Well, we already know, uh, at least with Bill Clinton, um, that, you know, he can use a technology in a way that will uh, out um, fundraise any of us. And this is true, again, for different tasks. So if you're trying to seek investment advice, or if you're trying to get a better education, or if you're trying to get a better recommendation for a restaurant, um, all of these things. So, you know, this is just to show that the technology by itself doesn't, in fact, make things even, although, you know, in some sense it spreads the access, but that the different outcomes also still depend on uh, capacities that we have, the social connections that we have, and so forth. Um, so technology in and of itself doesn't fix dysfunctional institutions. It doesn't make things more democratic. It does not shrink inequalities. And uh, what I'm going to do is go back through these quotes and then reconsider them. So uh, education. Uh, there have been so a series of very well-run, um, rigorous, randomized control trials showing, for example, that giving kids laptops has no material impact on anything that you would consider uh, good for their education, whether it's their grades, their test scores, um, their attendance at school, uh, their tendency to be disciplined. Um, this particular study by uh, two economists, Fairley and Robinson, did a study in, Cal in the state of California where they gave uh, half of about 1,000 children um, laptops and the other half were controlled, didn't get it, and that's exactly what they found. <coughs> um, a couple of years ago, I, you know, while I was writing this book, I need to find different ways to make income. And one of the things that I did was I taught at a nonprofit organization in Seattle called the Technology Access Foundation, which was founded by uh, Trish Zico, who used to be a Microsoft employee. Um, and this, this was a, a class, afternoon class for third through fifth graders. And our goal was to help teach them computer programming, robotics, um, you know, writing um, podcasts, and so forth. And my greatest battle in teaching them computer literacy was the computer itself. So as soon as my back was turned on any one child, they would all go and find whatever games they could online and play them. So this is a shot of one student over the shoulder. Uh, and ultimately, what I found was that you know this was. It was up to me as a teacher to really make sure that the students were focused and I you know, talked to a lot of the other teachers to see what kind of rules they had. Um, and it was only through kind of a very difficult process of imposing that discipline that the children end up being able to focus on programming. So you know, even in a class about computers, it's not that you want to maximize screen time, you just want to make sure that the tool is being used for learning. Um, finally, this is Lakeside School. So another thing that I did uh, was to work at this school for a couple of months. and. You know, Lakeside School is the school that Bill Gates went to. Uh, it has a lot of technology. Um, the kids are all required to carry laptops. They also have smartphones. Uh, they tweet their, you know, sports results. Uh, they communicate by email with all their teachers. Um, and, uh, you know, many of the children are, you know, probably children of your colleagues. They're executives at, uh, you know, Google, um, Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, and the student-teacher ratio there is amazing. It's like nine to one, right? So this is an amazing school. It's got all the resources it wants. It has all the technology it wants. Uh, so what do the parents pay for when they want an extra boost for their kids? Well, I was there as a substitute tutor for a friend. So basically, they were, the parents were paying me to provide more adult guidance for the students who are having challenges. And what's interesting is my guess is, uh, for all of you who are parents, you probably have some kind of guidelines about how you want your kids to use technology, either at home or at school. Is that the case? Kind of, I see a bunch of people nodding. Um, and so there's some, you, we have some intuition, wise parents have some intuition that the technology in and of itself is not necessarily a net positive and you have to be very careful about uh, how children access it. I think of it as, you know, it has, it's the equivalent of uh, of automobiles except in the cognitive domain, right? So we don't happily give uh, the right to drive to our children because we know that as powerful and as amazing a technology as a car is, that they can get into a lot of trouble with it. And I believe wise parents have that same intuition with uh, digital technologies. Um, but it's not something that we are yet, you know, we have yet shared with the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a lot of kind of push from the technology firm side to get more and more technology into schools. Okay, with respect to democratization, so I'm going to talk a little bit about revolution. So this was again uh, Egypt, and you know it was often called the Facebook revolution. Well, so was it a Facebook revolution? Well, 
Interestingly enough, in uh, Libya and Syria, uh, the dictators in those countries, as soon after they started getting protests, they shut down the internet in those countries. Okay? In Libya, uh, as you know, um, Gaddafi was eventually hunted down in the streets and executed by these militias. In Syria, the civil war is ongoing. The rebels have not given up, despite the fact that they have no social media to organize these rebellions. So what the how, how are they communicating? Uh, well, we of course know that previous generations have had revolutions very successfully without, you know, without any communication technologies, without uh, even electricity. Um, you know, I think if we're going to call the Arab Spring a Facebook revolution, we have to call the American Revolution a lantern revolution because of Paul Revere and one if by land, two if by sea. Um, you know, basically, the lesson is that you know, revolutionaries will use whatever communication tools at their disposal. But just because they use those tools doesn't mean that the tools are the cause of the revolution. Uh, finally, this is China. Uh, China is amazing because this is a country of 1.3 billion people, and uh, some, over a billion of them now have mobile phone accounts, uh, and about 750 million of them are, are on the internet in one way or another. So this is a country that has an abundance of tech digital tools, and at least as far as we can tell, there is no you know, mass uprising to overthrow the government just because the tools are there. So all of this is to say that digital technology is not either uh, necessary or sufficient to have a democratic uh, revolution. And so this idea that, that Facebook was a critical part of, of, of the Egyptian revolution, I think is flawed. It was certainly, it played a role. It probably accelerated some of the um, protests and so forth. But I don't think it was the main, uh, the main event. Um, finally, what's the story with respect to uh, inequality? So um, one of the interesting things about massive open online courses, they were initially built as a free way for everybody to get an education, right? So anybody in the United States could certainly walk to the library uh, and take some of these courses. Um, recent studies have shown basically that the people who complete uh, MOOCs are basically a college educated professionals who already have jobs. So they are not um, you know, jobless high school dropouts. So any idea that providing the content for education free to everybody immediately levels the educational playing field is, is broken somewhere. Um, what about other uses of the internet? So uh, I don't know if you remember, but Zach Braff, the actor director, ran a Kickstarter campaign to fund one of his movies. And there was a bit of an outcry because he raised over $3 million. Uh, and people are like, well, you know, this is a successful actor. You know, why can't he use his own money instead of asking the public for it? Um, but despite that, you know, uh, that backlash, he was still able to raise $3 million. Um, the average Kickstarter campaign raises $6,000. So what that tells you is that you know, your popularity, your celebrity status is still the thing that matters in a world in which everybody's able to raise uh, money online. Um, and finally, I'm going to show this graph. So this is a graph from the United States Census Bureau. And basically, this green line at the bottom is the rate of poverty in the United States. Uh, it declined from about 1940 through 1970. And then since 1970, it's been basically flat. Um, this graph doesn't show it, but after this, it's gone up because of the recession. OK, since 1970, we've also had this explosion of digital technologies. In fact, all of the technologies that all of us use and work on are uh, inventions since roughly about the 1970s. Right? So I'm not saying that the technology has caused this flatlining. But if you believe that the invention of novel technologies and their penetration in a population in and of itself causes beneficial social change in terms of poverty alleviation or eliminating inequality, then basically the juxtaposition of these two very obvious facts suggests that there's something, you know, something not quite right with that story. Um, and so uh, you know, basically what I think is that in, the, in America, we are politically not yet committed to eliminating poverty. And so even though we have amazing tools that could help us in that fight, uh, you know, the human forces are not there to, to be amplified by the technology. OK, so uh, um, you know, a lot of times at this point, especially if it's a technology-heavy uh, uh, audience, you know, I feel like there's a general subduing of the mood. Um, but, but there is a lot of bright side. Okay, so amplification is not all bad. In fact, it's a potentially very powerful thing. So what I'm going to suggest is, you know, how can we use technology in a positive way? And are there other things that we need to do as technologists to help the world uh, become a better place? So you know, the main lesson of amplification is that for technology to have positive impact, we have to ensure that the right human forces are in place first. Uh, so in a project 
that we did in India, that we started in India, uh, this is a project called Digital Green. Uh, we use digital video in a particular way to uh, basically feature local farmers and how-to videos and then use those videos as teaching aids for other farmers to learn about better agricultural practices. And uh, this system is now, it's been turned, in, we spun it off as a nonprofit. It's been funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, by USAID, by uh, uh, DFID, which is the UK's um, uh, uh, aid organization. And uh, it's impacting something like 5,000 rural villages, uh, mostly in India, also parts of Africa as well. But the critical thing about Digital Green is that even though it uses a lot of technology, it always needs to piggyback on an existing organization that has good trust and rapport with farmers. And as long as those organizations are focused on helping farmers uh, learn better agriculture, then this methodology, which involves technology, can basically help them do it better. It amplifies the positive effect of an organization that's already doing good work. Uh, one of the you know, the caution there is that it's not that you can, if you spread more of these videos, that farmers become better farmers. In fact, in countries like India, there's already a lot of uh, television shows, which most farmers do have access to, in which they're constantly streaming, you know, agricultural videos and so on. But those don't seem to have the impact simply because, um, you know, they, the farmers don't have any reason to trust that this information is relevant for them. You know, it's often out of context. They don't know the people who produce the video. Whereas, as long as we work with local organizations that have rapport with farmers, uh, that trust is there. Um, another thing that uh, I think we can do as a technology industry is actually help other people become productive in our own industry. So, you know, one of the great, I think, mistakes that people generally make is to believe that somehow technology is you know, successful and is a source of economic development because that's, that appears to be what happens at companies like Microsoft and companies in Silicon Valley. Um, and therefore, we should give other people the technology. But the reality is, you know, all of you, you answer, you know, many of you answered that you were as rich as you wanted to be uh, to the previous question. And you can answer that not because you own fancy devices, but because you have the education and the entrepreneurial capacity to actually earn a living that allows you to purchase those devices, right? So for example, if I buy you know, a laptop with Microsoft software, I'm not really getting that much richer, but Microsoft shareholders and employees are benefiting from that. So the best way to help people through technology, if that's really what we want to do, is actually to help them become producers of the technology. So this is Patrick Awea. He uh, used to be a Microsoft uh, program manager. Um, and he launched a university in Ghana called Ashesi University uh, because he believed that the opportunities that he had, the educational opportunities he had in the United States were ultimately the underlying um, cause for his success. And I think that was, uh, tr uh, it was a very um, you know, true insight. He didn't decide after retiring from Microsoft that he was going to start a business that was going to generate gadgets for people who are poor. He said, we, what we really need is for people to become better educated. Uh, this university is one of the most successful private liberal, liberal arts schools in um, Africa now. It's widely recognized. Uh, and he's basically, you know, at this point, I think it's in his 12th year. And there is now a generation of students um, who are kind of falling, following into in his footsteps. So many of them have gone through, you know, they've basically gone through a reasonably successful career, uh, often in software engineering, sometimes in business, and they've now kind of quit those because they wanted to do something that uh, gives back to society. Okay, finally, uh, I'm going to talk about two different um, potential science fiction outcomes. So, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting is ever since I left Microsoft, uh, I used to do work in computer vision. And one of the things that I thought, you know, back when I did, was actually doing research in this area was that it would still be a few decades before we have um, uh, image processing to the point that you could give a computer an image and it would output a text description. But a year or two ago, researchers in computer vision have basically shown that that's actually doable because we now have enough annotated imagery, we have the computing power, and we've become a little bit smarter about how to apply the learning algorithms that uh, we've been learning on, uh, we've been working on. So, uh, you know, I actually think we are potentially very close to what Ray Kurzweil has dubbed the singularity, you know, the moment when. Um, some of our machines become smarter than human beings. And I think that moment is uh, both amazingly um, interesting but also terrifying because I don't think we can predict at all how that technology will be used and so forth. And I think it's really up to us uh, in the technology industry to potentially decide that since it will come out of our labs. So there are two possible you know, outcomes for this. One is 
The Matrix. Okay, so uh, I'm sh I'm sure most of you have seen this movie. Uh, in it, there is a advanced you know AI that harvests human energy to feed machine masters while offering the illusion of a pleasant life. Right. I want to suggest that we already have companies that do this. <laughs> and because this is a Microsoft audience, I want to suggest that this is true of Facebook. Um, it is fundamentally not that different, right? It, basically, Facebook is harvesting your attention, your and my attention, to sell to advertisers, and they benefit the more time we spend on Facebook. Um, now, you know, I think Facebook on the whole is relatively innocuous, but I could easily imagine that if Facebook, the company, ends up with, you know, with a machine that is not only smarter than us, but able to become smarter and smarter and smarter, the way that the singularity is supposed to work, that you know, one day we will all be zombies online, unable to take our eyes off of Facebook, basically because you know, it, is such a compelling, it provides such a compelling experience that was machine generated. Um, you know, I don't think we want that world. And it requires those of us who are closest to this technology, including many of you, to actually decide before we hit this, you know, what I think of as a nuclear bomb in uh, the IT world of, uh, of incredible machine intelligence, um, to kind of decide what rules this technology should have. So uh, I don't know if how many of you have read Isaac Asimov, but in many of his robot stories, he has something called the three laws of robotics. And every robot, after some point in his uh, book chronology, basically is you know, endowed with these laws. And they're, unable, they're basically unable to break the laws without some immense you know, uh, suffering for, on their part. Uh, the, first, the first law is that no robot should allow a human to come to harm or through neglect uh, allow human to come to harm, and um, you know we don't we haven't even begun to discuss you know this kind of idea, but I think it's essential that we do, and I think that you know all of you in this room as well as many of the people at Microsoft are exactly the you know the people to think about this, and I think we you know there's an opportunity to be the first to stake um, you know to make a stake in the ground with respect to how we should respect this technology in a way that uh, it does serve positive ends and not just those of uh, shareholders. Um, Maybe it's good to know because all the rich people become zombies and those who don't have access to internet. Access. Well, you know, that would be true if Facebook would be happy to, uh, to be used just by wealthy people, but, um, but it's actually hungry for more users. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Star Trek future in which you know, this is Jean-Luc Picard in uh, one of the movies. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. And he's talking about human lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. So, you know, one of the conceits in Star Trek is that this happened because of technology. Uh, you know, we eventually got to a point where food became, you know, as easy as ordering it in one of what's it called, the matter replicators. Um, and uh, I actually think, you know, what is unsaid here is that somewhere in the intervening years between now and the Star Trek future, there were other social, cultural, political battles that were fought, such that the immense you know, resource uh, abundance that they eventually have in the future was actually relatively evenly distribu distributed. So in our world today, there's already enough food to feed the entire population such that there's no malnutrition. But for whatever reason, the balance of food distribution is such that there are you know, over 800 million uh, people in the world who still uh, go to bed hungry every day. And so that suggests that it's not enough to have the, technolo the technology to generate plenty. There's something else, which I believe is, again, social, cultural, economic, and political, and that those forces need to be addressed as much as the technology. Um, and so, you know, especially for those of us in the technology industry, I think we want to make sure that the technology helps us, not you know, exacerbates a situation that's already harmful. Um, and to the, you know, I do believe that, um, again, many of you in this room have the potential to uh, affect how technology gets used in the future. So I'm going to end there and uh, take questions. Thank you. All right. Questions? Comments? And it was when you were talking about, uh, well, I'll give you the question, and then you'll know probably when, we, when you were talking about it. Uh, so what about Sugata Mitra and his hole-in-the-wall project where kids learned 
diverse and deep subjects from just having access to the internet with no knowledge of computers. Okay, great. So the question was, what about Sugata Mitra, who was the founder of a project called Hole in the Wall, uh, which some of you may have heard. Uh, Mitra uh, won the, I think, the TED Prize in, I think it was 2013. And he believes in something called minimally invasive education. And that project was uh, begun in India. It was begun in Delhi. And we actually invited him to give a talk in the early days uh, when he was working on it. And basically, the idea is to provide a rugged uh, PC um, freely available to neighborhoods that are relatively poor so that kids can come and play on them. And his claim was that uh, within days, the kids would learn how to use a computer, they would learn how to use Google, uh, and then in some of his later studies, the claim was that these kids would then teach themselves English uh, as well as, um, I think it was, uh, uh, what was it, biomechanics. Right? So they're supposedly learning these very complex subjects on their own with no adult supervision whatsoever. Um, if you look through the papers that basically cite these crazy uh, ideas about what these kids accomplish on their own, um, it turns out that they're mostly written either by Sugata Mitra himself or by teams that worked very closely with him. Um, other researchers who have gone and looked at the hole in the wall projects in different places have found that you know, within months, they're often in a state of disarray. They're not working. And when you actually ask the adults in the neighborhood what they remember, uh, many of them say, well, there were you know, older teenagers coming here to play video games. Uh, and that's not really a surprise. Um, you know, if you look over the shoulder of any child with a smartphone, they are not solving math problems. They are not learning biophysics. They are playing Angry Birds. And you know, that tells you that you know, again, it's this idea that the technology is sufficiently powerful that on the one hand, children have an immense you know, desire to learn. They're naturally curious. On the other hand, they have a tremendous uh, potential to be endlessly distracted. And when you give them a tool that can do both, you know, most children tend to choose a distraction because it's easier and requires less mental effort. Um, so uh, yeah, Sugata Mitra, unfortunately, I think is, you know, um, despite what he says, is not, uh, is not the real thing. The technology is really not teaching children. Yes. Let me know if I'm saying it correctly. I think you said uh, your first question was how many of you feel you're rich enough? Is that, is that the question? Is it telling, especially, uh, well, is it telling that I think most people in the crowd are thinking rich as far as money? And especially when you're saying technology, uh, I guess my question is do you feel as more people who are focused on technology as a way to how do I become rich rather than how do I use technology to help others? Um, yeah, so the question was, are more people thinking of the technology as how do I become rich as opposed to how do I uh, help others? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I frankly do not know, but I do think that on average, uh, more people are you know, concerned about how to make their own lives better than necessarily how to improve other people's. And that's you know, true even for me. I mean, as much as I, you know, I am focused in my professional career on trying to find, you know, do research that helps with international development. The fact is, if you add up all the hours in my day, most of my day is spent on, you know, selfish personal interests. Um, and so, you know, I think on the whole, we are as a society tending towards a little bit more about, you know, what we need. And that makes sense. I mean, you have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your family. Um, but, you know, what I think we want to move towards is a society in which more and more of the percentage of our time and effort and resources are spent on trying to help others also attain a similar uh, quality of life. Uh, yes, in the back. Curious how, I hope that one day you'll have a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg, but I'm, I'm curious how you will have that conversation. So he is the stand now for the true technology believer, right? Yes. How are you going to approach him? Uh, that's a good question. So, you know, at some level, if I had to pinpoint one person who is the core audience for this book, it's actually Bill Gates. Uh, you know, I think he made an incredible transition in his own life, you know, similar to Patrick's, uh, in which he decided he was going to quit focusing on you know, Microsoft and more on his foundation. And he has definitely done that. Uh, at the same time, I think he has a tendency to want to solve the world's problems through engineering rather than through causing you know, deep changes in human beings. And you know, I think Mark is uh, you know, potentially cut from a similar cloth. It's interesting, in his private giving, he actually gives to educational projects in the United States. You know, he's given some, over $200 million to uh, school systems in the country. Um, but with respect to internet.org, uh, you know, the interesting thing about that project is, is that it is actually apparently under what's called the growth division at Facebook, which tells you that the intention of that project is not necessarily to help, you know, people do interesting things on the internet, but rather to expand Facebook's empire. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, the first thing I would ask him is, you know, are you really serious when you say that you think that, you know, spreading the internet in the way that you're doing is really helping people? And, uh, and if he's actually serious, I would say the next thing I would want to do is, you know, take him to a trip to a very poor village in which they happen to have the internet, and there are more and more of these, um, and show him that not much happens, you know, as a result of the technology. Uh, I think you had a question. So when you visited India about 10 years back, uh, I believe the barriers to uh, access to the laptop and the internet is far higher than what it is now, where the next generation has access to the mobile phones with internet connection. Yes. So do you think the scenario would be a little different than what you might have observed? Uh, and when you talk about access, you mean kind of like access in the market in terms of being able to buy these technologies at a lower cost? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, it's certainly, I mean, all around the world, it is getting easier and easier to get access to lower and lower cost goods. In fact, uh, this year marks the year when very likely the number of mobile phone accounts in the world will exceed the human population. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody will have a mobile phone because many people have multiple phones, but um, it's an interesting barrier. And basically what that means is that the technology is spreading. Uh, so, you know, if you believe that, you know, for example, the fact that you own the internet somehow dramatically improves your life, then, you know, we sh we're on a path to eliminating poverty for good, right? Uh, I suspect that 10 years from now, we'll be having similar conversations, but not with mobile technology. It will be with tablets or, you know, or maybe with drones. It will be with another technology. Uh, and I don't think that aspect is going to change. In fact, you know, in a, previ a previous generation thought very similar things about television. They thought, you know, with television, we, know, we can democratize education. We no longer have to send kids to schools and pay for expensive teachers. Now you have audio and video being, you know, streamed right into everybody's living rooms. Why don't we just have kids sit there and watch TV and they'll become educated? Uh, and I, my guess is in 15 years or less, we'll look back and say, why did we think of these crazy things about the Internet? Uh, yeah, in the back. So, I mean, this case goes back to the same question, like the, effect, the effectiveness of teachers. So, in my experience, certainly, you know, person as a teacher is much more effective than a program, and it's echoed in these stories of Udacity and so on, not really having the full potential. Do you think there's some fundamental law at work, or have we just not found the right program that, you know, instead of providing the distraction of a video game, it provides it draw of a video game, but at the same time educates people? Uh, that is a great question. So I have two responses to that. One is, um, you know, I think the fundamental flaw in a lot of this is to believe that education is about the material content of what you're learning, right? So there are these tendencies to take the textbook and say, well, textbooks are boring, so we need to amp them up. Um, and everything that we have that's digital is really, you know, a flashy, blingy, sound effect, you know, uh, um, immersed version of these textbooks. And the content is still the content, right? The real problem with education, I think, is, is the motivation of the student to do the hard internal work to learn, right? And that motivation um, it can conceivably be generated through some amount of technology, but really the best, th you know, the best solution for generating motivation is other people or even the internal motivation that you know, students themselves have, right? And, um, and really, at this point, we have no substitute for that other than other human beings. And human beings are good at scolding kids, encouraging kids, inspiring kids. And you know, I think there's arguments to be made that all of those things need to be used in a very smart you know, way in order to help a child develop the intrinsic motivation so that they learn. The other thing is with respect to gamification, right? So there's a lot of talk about gamification and how you can use games to help motivate students to learn. And I think that's probably true. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the research is you know, going in a direction where certain things can be gamified. But you know, imagine a world in which uh, everybody's K through 12th education is all gamified, okay, and possibly through video games. Well, at the end of that, if a student goes through that kind of education, maybe they will have learned the science and history and the math and the writing that you want them to learn. But they will become human beings who cannot learn unless it is in the form of a video game. And to me, that would be doing a much greater disservice to real education than, than having you know, in, you know, uh, inserted the content into their brains. Yeah. Well, Mike, I have kids in middle school and high school, and they're now embarking on a common, they're shifting over to the Common Core, which is a pedagogical approach that emphasizes communication, collaboration skills, critical thinking, problem-based learning, project-based learning. And I think it's going to be a challenge until teachers really understand that, and maybe parents, but I see that as being matched to the technology that used to just be doorstops if you randomly handed it to kids. But I think there's pedagogically, what you need is a pedagogy that goes along with it, which is in line with 
for what you're saying, but I actually am way more optimistic about the you know five year uh, time frame for education because I'm really impressed with what they're trying to do um, in a lot of schools now. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jonathan. So. You know, I believe that what you're saying is absolutely true for good schools and for schools which can attract strong teachers who know how to incorporate technology and do really interesting things with it. Um, but, you know, most of the educational problems that we talk about in this country are not, we are not worried about the kids who are going to private school who have wealthy parents who can find a way to pay for tutoring and all of this. Uh, we are worried about the kids where the teachers are unfortunately not the best teachers. Uh, you know, they're in school districts which don't raise enough budget to be able to afford even the basic things that you, you, know, you and I would expect in a regular education. And to me, you know, if we were suggesting that pushing more technology into those schools is going to help them, uh, it doesn't work for exactly the opposite reason of why our schools work with technology, which is, again, amplification, right? So if you're in an environment that is unable to help kids learn what they could be learning even without the technology, then the technology is not going to help them learn more. Uh, I think that's consistent with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, Technology and professional development for teachers are number one and two. You know, yes. Technology is maybe four. You know, That's right. Is three, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so I have two things. So the first one, I was wondering if you could just um, sort of spitball some thoughts about the idea that Silicon Valley is a meritocracy. Um, okay. And then the second one was, um, so as we're like progressing and moving towards a more digital marketplace for cheap labor, um, I want to know your thoughts on like actionable steps that um, we could take um, sort of help mitigate the exploitation of human resources. Like uh, okay, yeah, big, two big questions. So the first one was, that's all right. Uh, the first one was, you know, whether Silicon Valley is a meritocracy or not. Um, you know, I think it's a reasonable meritocracy, but it's obviously clear that it is not a pure meritocracy in the sense that there are plenty of people who have, you know, tremendous amounts of skills and talent, but who are excluded for reasons other than their capacity. Um, at the same time, I think that even thinking of meritocracy as the end all and be all has a problem in that, you know, if you have a meritoc meritocracy, all that it does is then create a new, uh, new form of separating people in which those who somehow have managed to gain the mysterious thing called merit end up getting all the advantages of our society. But we're not focused on helping everybody else get that merit as well. And so, you know, I think meritocracy is a better alternative to, you know, many of the systems that depend on nepotism and seniority and things like that. But it's still not the final thing. I mean, we have to go beyond meritocracy. Um, to your second point, second question, uh, which was again, remind me. Um, so I was saying that as we're like moving towards a more, like we have this digital marketplace for yeah. cheap labor. So right. Labor is becoming cheaper and cheaper. What are the steps that we can do, we can take to sort of help mitigate this, like, you know, exploiting human resources? Right. Um, you know, so one of the greatest challenges, I think, is that uh, as the technology is, becomes more and more capable, uh, it means that. A, the, all of the jobs that depend on those capabilities basically become le, uh, less and less uh, productive in terms of economic income, right? And, you know, basically, you can't, get, you can't make money doing those jobs because there's a cheaper way to do it through machines. And what that means, generally, is that you have to ensure that more people are educated or have the skills to the point that it exceeds whatever the machines are capable of doing. Um, you know, if uh, machine learning, for example, keeps improving, you know, it might be that a good percentage of the people in this room eventually will have to fight for their jobs because we don't have the capacity to compete with those machines. I think the only answer to these things is political, which is to say, it is, this is not a technology problem. Uh, it is a problem of our larger society and how we decide to allocate the resources that the society produces. And, um, and I do think that all of us who are in the technology industry actually can do an immense uh, service to the politics of this country by basically coming out and saying, look, we are working on these amazing technologies, but they are not going to solve these you know, deep social problems for you. We have to, as a country, address them from a political angle. Um, and I don't think that's going to go away. In fact, you know, one of the conclusions of my book, I didn't go too much into this, is that exactly in a world where there's a tremendous amount of technology, if you believe in amplification, we should be working on the other side, which is the human, human side. Uh, yes, in the back. Okay. One last question. Uh, so the question I have dovetails really nicely with her questions, uh, so this is great. Uh, would you view your reading of technology and its purpose as deeply egalitarian, or do you have kind of another interpretation of the purpose of technology? That is viewing technology to uh, instrumentally serve the public good, and that if it doesn't, if it deviates, we have a problem. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think 
the whole point of amplification is to say that the technology will amplify whatever we think it should be doing. And so, you know, to the extent that we as a civilization believe that it should be, you know, helping humanity in some sense mature and become more enlightened, I think the technology will help us do that. But, you know, if it all ends up being about maximizing shareholder value and making, you know, turning us into a world in which, you know, competition for resources is the primary objective, then the technology will amplify that in some sense turn us into a caricature of ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs>